Bon dia. Good morning. Good morning. Goedemorgen. Uh, I can continue with more languages, many languages. So I like to welcome you in the International Bible Church. Great you're here this morning. This morning we are going to serve our Lord, we are going to praise Him, we will sing and we will listen to a sermon. The message will be brought by Steve Feeden, like last month. So that's very great. Uh, you know, last month, uh, last month, last week, I'm a bit confused, sorry, last week. Steve said something remarkable. He said, if you travel and meet Christians abroad, you will have more in common than you have differences. Yeah, you remember you were here? Well, I support this statement, but in addition, I have good news. You don't have to travel. This statement fully applies to this church. So, if you want to meet other Christians, other cultures, go, just go to the International Bible Church here on Bonaire. So, let's do this, and I should stop talking, but let me say a prayer first. Yes, Lord, it's great to be here this morning with so many people from different cultures, so many different uh, backgrounds, different habits and whatever, but we have only one God, we have only one Jesus Christ we serve, and there is only one Holy Spirit that binds us together. And that's what we really like this morning, and thank you, you will be here, and please touch everyone here in the audience or who will be looking uh, at home uh, by following the stream. Uh, please touch us by the songs we sing, the message by Steve, uh, the fellowship afterwards. Thank you. In all those things we do together, you will be with us. Amen. Let's sing. Please stand. The first song is Praise Anthem.
Okay. Next song, you will see on the slide uh, phrases in white and in red, or I think it's more pink. But please, uh, now we start, we sing the white lines only. Yeah? guess what's going to happen. I like to split the audience into two groups and that's not so easy with this configuration. Um, yeah, well, that is side B and the rest is side A. I think you should, you should sing a little bit louder. Uh, <laughs> We're side A, you guys sing loud. So this is side A. Okay, side A starts and sing together with Rick and Shelly. And side B, sing together with Vera and me. And of course, I will let you know when you start. That is, when they start with the chorus, we start with the song.
should repeat that next month. So that was a f Okay. The, we have done this song before. I have a light.
since last month and um, then the ladies had a very nice bright voice so they did the echo during the first two lines and then the hallelujah was a bit higher do you remember please sing along with Vera and Shelley if you're one of the ladies and the guys sing with me okay can I have a short intro
please take a seat. Two announcements this morning. Uh, I'd like to remind you that after the service and after the coffee and fellowship, there is Sunday school. And I'm not sure where it is, over there, over there, but you will find out. If you want to join that, please stay. Sue has the, has the bell, she rings it. You want to make the announcement yourself? Okay, the misunderstanding, so I'll step back. Thank you. <laughs> I was elected last week during Sunday school class and reminded by Bob this morning that I was to give the announcement for Sunday school class. And it seems that uh, some of you never read your bulletins. Everybody show me your bulletin. <laughs> and on the page that has the list of songs, if you look on the left-hand side, number four, what does it say? Adult Sunday School, every Sunday after worship. So we have now moved into the air-conditioned room. COVID has allowed us to move in there, I hope. We were on the porch and we were shooing everybody away from the cookies and the, and the, the fruit juice and the coffee. But we have now moved into the Sunday School class into the air-conditioned room. And this is a time when we get together and we discuss whatever the pastor says. And uh, if we agree with him or don't agree with him, we can make our comments. Or if we just have something else we want to share. There was one Sunday that especially when Pastor Doug talked about awesome and awful being related, and some of us were like, how can awesome awesome and off will be related so we had a nice discussion on that so uh, the class is a time when we can get together and just have a good time discussing what has happened up here before us and um, maybe things that have happened to us during the week so when you hear my swiss cowbell it's time, maybe it's an Austrian one, I'm not sure. Anyway, when you hear that, it's time to head for the air conditioned room and enjoy a nice time together. Thank you. So I don't know if that was my time or not, but that's the announcement I was told to make. Thank you, Sue. You did very well. So, next. Next announcement uh, I bring in, because we need more people to help with the tag team, both ladies and gentlemen. Everyone could do this, or can do this, but I hope you're willing to do so. Now there's only a few that are setting up the mics and uh, do the mixing during the service. Uh, and last week, um, John, who always helped every week, went back to Canada. So we really need some people. And if there are just some who do this, it's light work. And not for every week, but so now and then. So please help us. Uh, after service, come to Brad or come to me, or come to Renee, and uh, tell me that you want to help. So it's time for the offering, and I'll ask uh, our music team to play a little tune while the offering is uh, going on.
it's time for the scripture reading. So I'll switch to Dutch now. Vanochtend hebben we schriftlezing en ik ga u lezen uit de brief van Paulus aan de Filipenzen, het eerste hoofdstuk. Uh, uh, de versen 27 tot 30 en ik lees uit de nieuwe Bijbelvertaling. Leef in overeenstemming met het evangelie van Christus, zodat ik kan horen of straks zelfs kan zien dat u één van geest bent en samen voor het geloof in het evangelie strijdt. Laat op geen enkele manier door uw tegenstanders angst aanjagen, want dat is een teken van God. Voor hen dat ze ten onder gaan, voor u dat u wordt gered. Aan u is de genade geschonken, niet alleen in Christus te geloven, maar ook omwille van hem te leiden. U voert dezelfde strijd die u mij vroeger hebt zien voeren en die ik, zoals u hoort, nog steeds voer. Rick, can you do this in Papiamento? Filipenses 1, versículo 27 to 30. E unico costa a war pa bosa biva un vida cuta quadra cu e bon notícia de Cristo. Passeia ora mi abin mira boso of mi tene di boso den ausencia mi ahaya sa cu boso ta pa para firme. Uni pa mes un spiritu i cu boso ta lucha una ni mement una ni memente pa causa di e fe den e bon notícia. No laga bozo enemigo nan spanta bozo de nada. E se lo demonstra nan ku nan ta bai perdi i ku bozo ta haya salvashon. Jos ta soru pa se. Pa sobra bozo no ta haya solamente e privilegio ti kere den Cristo, pero tambe di sufri pe. Bozo ta pasando den un mes un lucha ku bozo a mira a mi pasa a den. I ku awar boso atene ku mi ta pasando aden ke tu bai. And last but certainly not least, Shelley in English. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come to see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of, your, of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but suffer for his sake. Engage in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Okay, Steve, it's time for you now. Yeah. All right, good morning, church. No, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. So if you guys have Bibles uh, with you, I'll have you mark two places this morning. Uh, first place is 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and the second place is Matthew chapter 5. So again, if you'd like to follow along, I'll be uh, reading those passages only in English uh, <laughs> as well. But if you like to mark and you have a, a, a language that you're more comfortable with, you might want to mark those in your Bible. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 9. If you don't know where that is, your Bible has a table of contents in the front. You can look it up there uh, and, and find your way to 1 Corinthians 9 and Matthew chapter 5. And while you're turning there, I have a question. Is anybody here this morning that's just on the island for a short vacation? Anybody come? You're on vacation. 
Awesome, awesome. God bless you guys for coming. That's it. We found this church because we were uh, from the States on vacation and said, you know, we're on vacation, but that doesn't mean we're on vacation from God. So let's find a group of, of um, people to fellowship with. And we ended up here and we keep coming back uh, every year to the uh, International Bible Church. So God bless you guys. I'd love to meet you afterwards and see where you're from and, and how long you're on the island. Um, so thank you guys for coming. 1 Corinthians 9. Matthew 5, I think you've got them marked, and I hope that over the next 30, 35 minutes, I'll sufficiently confuse you that you'll need to go to Sunday school to figure out what in the world I was talking about. I had a young guy from our church that said, Pastor, we believe you are smarter than Albert Einstein. You know Albert Einstein? See, he's so smart that when he talks, only a few people can understand him. But when you talk, nobody understands you. So I don't know if he's right or not. Let me read uh, to you and with you 1 Corinthians 9, not the whole chapter. We're going to start in verse 19 and read down to verse 23. You'll get a sense of what we're going to talk about. And uh, the title for the message will be Servant Evangelism. Servant Evangelism. 1 Corinthians 9, 19 says, For though I am free from all men... I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. And to the Jew, Jews I became as a Jew that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law as under the law that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law as without law, not being without law toward God but under law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became as weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partaker of it with you. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, I pray that you would, if you haven't already, kindle in this church, kindle in our lives, in my life, a heart, a desire, a passion for people who don't know you. That we would be willing to hear what you're saying, what Paul is saying, and apply it to our own lives, how we can live that way as servant evangelists. Lord, we pray that this church would continue to be a, a lighthouse and a beacon on this island for people that are passing through and for the people that live here and stay. It's in Jesus' name I pray, all God's people said. Amen, amen. So my question as we start is, how does the word evangelism make you feel? Uh, what is your experience with evangelism? Now, maybe you don't know, I'll, I'll let you know. The word evangelism uh, is the English, obviously, uh, combined from two Greek words. One word means good, and the other word means message. It's the word angel. The word angel is in there. An angel is a messenger by definition. So evangelism is the idea of sharing a good, a good message. There's a good message, and don't we live in a world where we need some good messages? And I, I, things are, are uh, seeming to come unglued all over the globe, but in the Bible, there is good news. There's a good message. So again, I'll ask you, what's your experience with evangelism? Does it make you afraid? Does it, is it intimidating to you? Are you uncertain about how do I share my relationship with God, with other people. Maybe I don't know what to say. Maybe I don't know how to do it. Maybe I don't, uh, I don't feel it's my job. Maybe that's what the pastor does or the ministry team does. So again, I ask, what's your experience with evangelism? How does that make you feel? Now, let me commend those that are part of the International Bible Church. In my experience, you guys have seemed to do very well at caring for one another. There's a closeness here, there's relationships here, there seems to be a love uh, of one another and a care for one another. That's the commendation. Much like the letters in the book of Revelation, the commendation is also followed by a challenge. And I, and I don't know the answer to these questions, so you'll have to tell me, how is International Bible Church and how are you individually doing with sharing your faith with other people? leading other people to Christ. When's the last time you had a chance to build a relationship with a person who had no idea who God was or maybe a wrong impression of God and through a friendship with them, through sharing a common interest, 
you were able to talk to them about the truth of the God that you love and who loves you. And through that, they got saved. And they got baptized. And now they're walking with the Lord. Their whole life has been transformed. Have you had that experience? Has the church had that experience? I've been asking around. I said, when is the last time there's been a baptism through the International Bible Church? And it seems that it's been some time. Now, I don't say that to be condemning towards you. I say that to say, I think this is why the Lord has me to bring this message to you. There's an aspect of your Christian life that may be being ignored or overlooked. And that's what I'm here to talk to you about this morning. You see, it's easy as a Christian to exist in what we call the Christian bubble. Do you know what the Christian bubble is? That's where all of your relationships and all of your life all exists around people who are already Christians. Now, you would have no way of knowing this, but I never went to seminary. I, don't, I didn't live in that world. I didn't grow up heading that direction. I was a blacksmith. Uh, in Dutch, I learned this morning, hoofsmit, hoofsmit, horseshoer in English, uh, German hoofschmied. I don't know it in any other languages, but that's it. So our story is that that's how I, I, I got saved working in that profession, and I started teaching Bible studies, and the people that came were people that lived in the horse world. They, they worked with horses. They rode horses. And those are the people that I had relationship with. And then I became a pastor. And all of a sudden, I was in the Christian bubble. And my ability to, an opportunity to evangelize, actually became worse. Because I was living and working with only people who were Christians. And that was no fun. I mean, it was fun. It was good. But I had, they all knew about Jesus. It got boring. And so I had to, in my life, find other ways and other places to insert myself among people who didn't know God. Now, the story of our church is that we started with two families in a living room, me with a, a Bible, and, and uh, we passed the plate between two couples. Okay, passed it to my wife. Hey, honey, put some money in. And the church grew from there. We didn't have a praise team. We didn't have anything except a Bible and a desire to live for Jesus and let God do with that whatever he would do. And as a result, the church has grown over the years. The danger of that is that now we have things. We have a budget. We have money. We have a building. We have a nice building. We don't have a building. We have a campus. We have a multiple buildings. And the danger in that as a church is that you become inwardly focused. And when you become inwardly focused, you begin to die. In Israel, there's two bodies of water. Well, there's more than that, but there's two I'm going to focus on. There's the Sea of Galilee. Water comes in, and then water goes out via the Jordan River down to the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea only has an inlet. It has nowhere for the water to go out like the salt pans it only collects the water, never gives it out, and as a result, it is what? It is dead. The Sea of Galilee is full of life because it takes and it gives. The Dead Sea is dead. So with that introduction, uh, I'm going to draw your attention back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and, and let you know that the, uh, the, the background, the context of this passage is that the Apostle Paul is talking to the church about their freedom and the willingness to give up freedom for the sake of love. And he's using the idea that there was problems with uh, eating certain kinds of food. The Jews didn't eat certain kinds of food, certain kinds of meat sacrificed to idols. But the Gentiles, the non-Jews, had no problem with that. And this was creating a real controversy. They couldn't go out to lunch together because the Gentiles wanted steak and the Jews wouldn't eat it because they didn't know where it came. It wasn't kosher. And so it was starting to trouble their fellowship. And so Paul says, look, I know you're free to eat any meat you want. You're, you're not saved by the food you eat or the clothes you wear. You're free. But for the sake of fellowship, you should be willing to give up some freedom. And freedom to eat meat. Paul says, if eating meat would stumble somebody that I love, then I will never eat meat again. That's, that's, a, that's love, isn't it? Somebody, how many of you like to eat your meat? Ah, I need, need my, right? So he says, I'm willing to give that up. 
And so in that context, he's saying, look, look at all the ways that as a believer, as a pastor, as an evangelist, I've given up my freedoms in my life for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of people being able to hear God's word and receive it. One of the things he gave up is every time he traveled, he never collected money from the people in the church where he was preaching because he didn't want people to misunderstand why he was there. So the other churches would support him like, I'm here supported by our church in America so I can come here and preach the gospel to you, not at any charge to you. Otherwise, you'd say, well, I don't know if we can trust that guy. Maybe he's just about the money. So there's a time and a place in our life to give up freedom for the sake of the gospel. And that's where Paul is. Now he's applying that to evangelism. He says in verse 19, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. I'm going to give you seven rapid, I hope rapid fire, quick things that might help you to enhance or to have a more vibrant evangelistic life, to be more successful at sharing your faith with others. Seven things. If you want to take notes, you can count them. The first thing is that Paul had freedom. Did you see that? He says, though I am free from all. Presently, under no obligation to any group, to any ethnicity, to any nation, to any denomination, he was free. He's not saved by sharing the gospel. He's not doing it under pressure or out of guilt or obligation. Do you know free people just do a lot more for the Lord when they sense that they're free? You ever feel constricted? You ever feel constrained? I hate that feeling. And I just want to fight against whatever is constraining me. When people are set free, all of a sudden, they begin to do more. So at our church in the States, and I hope here, I hope you feel free. Paul says, I'm under no obligation. Matter of fact, I'm not a slave. I am a mature son or daughter of God. I take responsibility, but I'm not treated like a slave. Did you know God doesn't treat you like a slave? You feel that way? God doesn't treat you like a slave. He treats you like a mature son or a mature daughter. He shares with you his heart and gives you the chance to take responsibility in his family. So the first thing he had, he had freedom. The second thing he had is he had a plan. Do you see what his plan is? He says, my plan is, although I'm free, I'm going to be a servant to everybody. You know where he got his plan? Can you take a guess? Does that plan sound familiar? Jesus came not to be served, but to do what, church? To serve. Well, there's a good plan. How about I just serve people? That, that's a plan that all of us can do. You might say, Pastor, look, I, I, there's people in the church that are just gifted evangelists, and we should just let them evangelize. But Paul would say, you might not be an evangelist, but you can be a servant. And if you can be a servant, guess what else you can be? An evangelist. And he says, I have made this decision from my freedom. I'm going to make my decision to be a servant to all. Literally the word slave. I'm going to make myself, I'm going to meet people where they are, and I am going to get involved with their life in what they're doing for their benefit. That takes sacrifice. I mean, I've only got a certain amount of time, a certain amount of relational capacity, and Paul says at least some of that I'm going to spend with all different kinds of people, people that I meet, people that are part of my community, and I'm going to meet them where they I'm not going to expect them to come to me. I'm going to go to them. I had a friend back in the States that said their church's evangelistic plan is we unlock the door on Sunday morning and we answer the phone if it rings. That's their plan for evangelism. Paul had a radically different and a quite successful plan. He said, I'm, I'm going to meet people where they are, and I'm going to serve them. Because he knew something else, he had a goal. Did you see his goal? He says, that I might win the more. That I might, notice the word might, that I might. In his goal, with his goal, he was realistic. Let's be realistic. You're going to talk to people, you're going to serve people, and they're not going to get saved. And you can't walk around with resentment. Well, I did what I was supposed to do and God didn't do his part. There's no promise that people are going to get saved, but there's potential. This passage is full of potential. 
And he says that I, that I might, that I might win some, or actually he says that I might win the more, the most. So he was realistic with his goal and he was ambitious. He wasn't satisfied with one or two a year. And I hope you're not either. He was very ambitious. The word in, in my New King James Version is win. It's also the word better translated gain. It's a term not from competition, but from the marketplace. When you go to the store, when you go to the grocery store, you take with you money, right? I hope you do. <laughs> Otherwise, you leave very hungry. You take with you money. And in the store, you find something that you like. My wife and I, it's chocolate croissants. Now, the store has fixed a value on a chocolate croissant, and I feel like I'm getting my money's worth. When I trade that money for that croissant, I'm getting something of value. I'm giving up the freedom to have money for the joy of having a croissant. Do you, are you tracking with me? I'm giving up money, but I'm gaining something of, in my opinion, greater value. Chocolate croissants. Now take that silly example and apply that to people. How much is it worth to you to see someone, the future history of their whole family, radically transformed? What's it worth to you? Who did it for you? How did you first hear? Who sacrificed, well, my earpiece is going to blow off here. Who sacrificed so that you could hear for the first time? For me, I, I, it's, an, it's a skill you can learn. Anything I can do to start a conversation at a restaurant, at the gym, at the beach, wherever you go, there's ways to start a conversation. Can I let you in on a little one of my secrets? When I meet a person or when I see a person and they have tattoos, that is an invitation to me to start up a conversation. Because it's a place where I can go, hey, tell me about your tattoo. People love to talk about it. It's there for a reason. So for me, it's an invitation to start a conversation, not knowing where that will lead, but there's possibility. What if that conversation leads to some connection where we find we have some things in common, and now we're striking out. Hey, let's get coffee together. Let's talk more. I'm getting to know you, and you're getting to know me. He had a goal that maybe. Maybe. Now, the fourth thing, if you're keeping track, he had flexibility. That's verses 20 through 22. He had flexibility. He wasn't locked into, this is how you do evangelism. And this is who does it. This is how our denomination does it. Well, we only, we only evangelize to people that are like us. None of that for Paul. He wasn't locked into a system. He wasn't locked into one right way. And he gives us some examples to illustrate how he's made himself a servant to all. Look at verse 20. He says, and to the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might win Jews. So Paul cared about his own people. Paul was a Jew. Yes? Yes. Say yes. Paul was a Jew. If you're awake, say yes. Paul was a Jew. He was Jewish by culture, by nationality. And he, in, in Romans, he says, man, I would give anything to see other Jewish people know Jesus, to see what they have through Jesus so how's Paul going to reach cultural Jews? He's going to embrace when he's with them, he's going to use the fact that he's Jewish and he's going to connect with them in their Judaism. He speaks their language. He speaks Hebrew. He can converse with them. He can make a connection as a Jew and he's going to engage in their traditions. Why? To be together with them so that they can see what his life in Christ is like and he hopefully wants to make them jealous of what he has in Christ. He's forming a connection. By the way, we just said goodbye in our church to a young couple from our area heading to Romania. We sent them off to Romania. Do you know where they're going to minister in Romania? They're going to minister in a deaf church in Romania. They only use sign language. And they had to learn Romanian sign language because there's different sign languages all over the world. They had to learn Romanian sign language so that they could go to Romania and reach people who don't use a spoken language. And I just thought that was amazing. 
I thought that was incredible. So how's Paul going to reach cultural Jews? He's going to be uh, culturally Jewish. He's going to use that to his advantage. And to those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. Well, how will Paul reach strictly religious Jews? Jews that held to the letter of the law, who had strict religious culture, strict religious practices. Well, he's going to use that aspect of his life. I, I get invited to places where, here, I, I love coming here because I can wear flip-flops. It's okay that I wear flip-flops, right? And a, and a light shirt. I can dress casual. At home, I dress casual. But there's some churches I've been invited to preach where if I didn't wear a suit, they wouldn't even listen to anything I had to say because to them, wearing a suit is a sign of respect for God. So if I want them to hear me, I have to wear a suit. And I'm willing to give up my right to be comfortable. I think suits were designed by people that had never worn one. <laughs> and I know this. Do you know why women live long, longer than men? Because they don't ever have to wear a tie. That's why. <laughs> you have to meet people where they are. And you have to relate to people differently. So you have to have a sensitivity. You have to be a good listener. You can't be thinking about yourself. You have to think about them. Be aware of who they are, how they feel, how they think. How, how difficult is it for older folks to reach a younger generation? Yeah, how hard is it? At home, it takes work. The youth these days, they, have so, they know things. They, have, they use language and words that I don't know what they're talking about. They have acronyms for things. And there's a whole culture, the whole youth culture that I have to ask them about. Hey, tell me what that means. Tell me about this thing called TikTok or Facebook. I mean, I don't know. It may be horrible, but it's your world, so I should know about it. Parents. You've got to understand the world your kids are living in if you want to reach them for Christ. Rather than distancing yourself, what we tend to do is we distance ourselves judgmentally from people rather than engaging them where they are. But Paul says, notice, he says, for those who are without law, as without law, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ, that I might win those that are outlaws, so to speak. So there was a whole group of people from Greek culture or Roman culture. They didn't care about kosher. They didn't care about religious traditions. They didn't care about any of that stuff. And Paul says, well, how am I going to reach them? I have to meet the irreligious, the unsaved, the sinners where they are. Isn't that what Jesus did? How do you get to be called a friend of sinners? Not just an acquaintance. Not just someone who knows a few sinners, but someone who was a, he was friendly to sinners. Now, for some people in church, that's radical. Because all we want to do is distance ourselves from a dark world. But how will a dark world ever see the light unless we bring it? In a non-judgmental, Jesus sat at the table with a group of tax collectors and they felt comfortable with him. Now, he did not ever, and Paul doesn't say that we should go and do sinful things. He doesn't say to get drunk with those who get drunk. He's not saying that. That's a sin. He says, I'm never so free that I don't still operate by the law of love and by the, the impulses of the Spirit of God in my life. I'm not free from that. But relative to the things that I can compromise on, I'm going to make a connection. One of my favorite ministries that our church has done in the past, which COVID interrupted, is related to verse 22. To the weak, I became as weak that I might win the weak. Some people are so afraid to share their weaknesses. We spend our life proving how strong we are. I started attending and going to what we call the soup kitchen. It was a place for homeless people that didn't have any food, didn't have a place to live, and we would go there. The church that it, that it took place in would feed them, but we would go, folks from our church would go to build relationship with people that were homeless. And we would share in their weakness by meeting them where they are. And you know what? We saw tremendous 
fruit from that. And then they would be going, you know, we'd be week after week after week, we're sharing lunch together, eating the same food, talking about their lives and what they've been through, sharing our own weaknesses. And then when something bad happens, when something really goes wrong, they ask, can you pray with me? Absolutely. And then they say, we, we want to come to church. And I say, well, there's the, the church where this was happening is about 30-minute drive from where our church is. And they would say, we want to come to church. And I would say, well, this is a church right here. You can go to this church. And they say, no, no, no. We want to come to your church. And we would pick them up in a van, drive them 30 minutes to our church, and drive them back. How does that happen? Relationship. Relationship. To the weak, I became as weak that I might win the weak. So he, now he gives a summary statement, and he says, I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. In any way, in every way possible. I like this in the New Living Translation. It says, yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. When our church was small, we didn't have a church building. We met in, in schools. We set up the chairs, and then we'd take them down. It was just, we were a portable church. But we had an office in the middle of our little town, and we called it Common Ground. And it was sort of like a coffee shop. And it was based on the New Living Translation of this verse, I try to find common ground with everyone. If I have any experience in my life, if I have any, a hobby, a, 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 a pastime, a language, anything I can find, then I'll use that to insert myself in a community where I can get to know people. And Paul, so the fifth thing he had is he had time. Now, this is interesting. Paul had time. It says, I have become, and the Greek tense for that speaks of permanence. I have permanently become all things to all men. This wasn't something he was going to try for a week, weekend motivated by a, a sermon or, or a seminar. This was the way he lived. And don't you know the more people you share the gospel with, the more people get saved. It's a matter of time. You just have to do it over and over. It has to be your permanent way of thinking about yourself. So he had time. And the sixth thing is he had determination. He was determined. Can, can I ask you another question? I know I ask a lot of questions. Is your faith valuable enough to you to share? If you don't value your faith, if you don't value your relationship with God, you're probably not going to share it. I mean, have you noticed that you, has that, have you ever recommended a restaurant to somebody? He said, man, you have got to try. We show up on the island. Hey, you've got to try this restaurant. I mean, the food here is life-changing. It's so good. You've got to go. Or, or there's this snorkeling spot, and you've got to go there. I mean, it's just an amazing snorkeling spot. You see, when something has touched your life, you naturally share it. Not like a salesperson, but like a satisfied customer. And if it's not valuable to you, then you have some other questions to ask yourself. Why is my faith not worth sharing? Why is it not worth exchanging some time so that others can know what I know? I don't know where I'd be. Without Jesus Christ, I don't know where I'd be. He has changed my whole family, changed my marriage. I wouldn't be the father, the husband I am today if it wasn't for Jesus. My children wouldn't be who they are if it wasn't for Jesus. I certainly wouldn't be doing the job I'm doing. I'd still be a hoofsmith <laughs> if it wasn't for Jesus. And, and I want other people to know what I know. I want them to feel the peace that I feel. I want them to know the love that I know. And I am determined, and Paul is determined, if only I can get with people and maybe they can see God through me, then maybe they will love him. And maybe they will find their lives transformed. 
you have to be like a mosquito. You know mosquitoes? Mosquitoes don't wait for a hole. They make their own. So you have to be a mosquito evangelist. Don't wait for an opportunity. Make one. Do you know someone else who had this kind of determination? You know, it's a trick question. In church, the answer is always Jesus, right? What did Jesus do so that you could have a relationship with the Father? He went from heaven, the comfort, the presence of the love of God in heaven. He humbled himself. He took on the likeness of human men. He entered into our world, and he suffered in our world in the likeness of flesh so that we might see God. And that's, so this is nothing new. This is, Paul is just following the Jesus style of servant evangelism. That's all he's doing. Jesus came to serve, and that's all Paul is doing. I asked you to mark Matthew 5, and we'll, I'll make this brief, and we'll, we'll come to a conclusion here. Matthew 5, 13 is a super appropriate verse for you. You know it already. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. Whether you like it or not, if you're a believer, if you're saved, if you're a Christian, if you're a son or daughter of God, you and you alone are the salt of the earth. That's your identity. You might go, I don't really feel like being salt. Tough. You are. And there is no plan B. You are God's plan A for the salvation of the world. How do you like that? You are God's plan A for the people of this island. Now, one of the things we love about coming here is you have huge, humongous mounds, mountains of salt. And you can't get to them. They won't let you in. Did you notice that? I mean, we, last time we were here, we happened to come at the time when the salt ship had come. They loaded it up, and there were piles of salt on the ground. And we just loaded up our bags, and we just loaded up as much as we could and uh, took it home with us. Cause it, and it is so good. It is so good. But what good does it do if it stays in a pile at one end of the island? It does no good. It has to be what? It has to spread out. It has to be in the restaurants and in the homes. And that's you. You and you alone are the salt of the earth. And if it loses its flavor, then it's, then it's good for nothing but be, to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. So if, how, do you salt, salt, how do you season salt? It's its nature. You, by nature, are the seasoning of the world you live in. And the purpose is for you to go into areas that need to be seasoned with the flavor of Christ. Not to hide in a big pile we call International Bible Church. We're just going to pile in more salt. People come here from other places. They're already believers. Let's make our salt pile bigger. That's not what we're about, bigger piles of salt. We're in a season in our church at home where we're sending salt out to other places in the world. Man, get them out of here. Go to places where nobody knows. So I'll, I'll leave the rest of that verse. That's, that's the, the idea there. Verse 23, he says, Now this I actively do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partaker of it with you. The final thing is he wanted to share in the experience. He, he knew that in life, there are some experiences that are meant to be shared alone. They're just for you. But aren't some things better when they're shared with other people? The other day, we had a chance to swim with spotted eagle rays. How cool is that? And I was sitting in my beach chair, and I saw my wife, who's a good swimmer, flapping her arms in the water. And I thought, what, she's not drowning. I know she can swim. What is that all about? And she was making a sign, like, it's a ray, it's a ray. So I swim out there so I could see this thing that she just wanted to share with me. Because then we can talk about it together. Then we can share the experience. Look, let me tell you this, and this is how I'm going to close. If you have found that your Christian life is getting stale, if you have found maybe you're not as vibrant or zealous as you used to be, you need some energy in your Christian life, can, I, let me tell you, guaranteed, if you begin to share your faith with other people, it will energize you for the experience of God. It will absolutely energize you. 
When you watch someone else enjoy Christ for the first time, all of a sudden you will feel energy come back into your life. It, you, you won't be able to stop. You won't be able to stop. Has your walk with God gotten cold or stale? Maybe you're here for a reason today. Maybe the God and his word are encouraging you to be a servant evangelist. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, I do pray that as I've spoken and shared from your word, that you might encourage uh, that word, that that might go deeply into people's hearts, that you would give us the courage, the boldness to actually uh, find time and place to be with people who don't know you, to build relationships, even friendships with people who don't know you. We pray, Lord, that they would see Christ in us, that they would feel the grace, they would feel the love, they would feel the acceptance of who they are, and that they would be saved. It's in Jesus' name I pray. All God's people said, amen, amen. 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 So, after the ser sermon, it's banjo time. We have two more songs, two banjo songs, thanks to Brian who was uh, facilitating this uh, for us. Uh, so please stand and sing with us, uh, sing along, praise Adonai.
So now may the God of peace, who brought again from dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the good blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please stay for fellowship, and we have coffee and some...